So I got a lot of requests to make a video about what exactly happened with the Ocean Gate sub and what happens when a submarine that's made out of plastic. And yeah, the majority of the Ocean Gate was made out of plastic. Now, a lot of people might be um, confused by hearing it was made out of carbon fiber. Well, yes, but carbon fiber on its own, you wouldn't be able to make an airtight hull out of. So you need something to bind the carbon fiber together with, which is typically a, a plastic, a polymer, a resin of some sort, usually epoxy. But a plastic submarine or not, what happens when you get a breach in the hull of these things at these very deep depths? And the reason I find that an interesting question is because most of the reporting that I see just says it's the immense pressure that kills you. Actually, there is basically no pressure on the water that actually kills you. I mean, I can rephrase this in that, you know, if you think about it from first principles, you know, the main difference is the weight of water falling on you here. So let's think about this from simple science. We know that objects, irrespective of their mass, fall at about the same rate. So imagine now I've created a cavity in the water that's about, I don't know, a meter tall or something, that I can magically take the walls away in an instant. Irrespective of how deep that is, the cavity would fill with water at basically free fall speed. I mean, sure, one will have a lot more energy than the other because one of them is a lot heavier object falling than the other. But it'll basically happen at the same speed. You know, bar some minor effects from the actual compression of the air within the pocket. I mean, sure, it's going to drown you in that, but it's hardly an explosive end of the sub. So why is everyone talking about debris fields? When we know that from the basic physics, the sub should have just filled with water in a few seconds. You snotty little bastard. Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. Okay, well, a lot of people will say, oh, come on, this is crazy. It's just the unimaginable pressure at those depths. And it's like, really? Uh, whales dive down to this sort of depth all the time without getting crushed by the unimaginable pressure. Not terribly surprising, because they're made up mostly of water, just like you are, and water is pretty incompressible stuff, as we'll see. So why is it, in the event of a hull breach, that you die in less time than it takes to get shot. This is a molecular dynamic simulation of a drop of water in air, which is everything you need to know here. The air there is exactly what you're breathing at the moment, with the red ones being oxygen and the blue ones nitrogen. And the water is what makes up about two thirds of your body by weight. Now, this is a computer simulation of what this is like, but these are actually pretty good for these sorts of properties. And what you're looking at is roughly a billionth of a meter in size and about a billionth of a second in time scale, eh, plus or minus a couple of orders of magnitude. Doesn't greatly matter at the moment. And for reference, the air molecules there are actually traveling around at about the speed of sound. Yes, the air molecules you're breathing travel at about the speed of sound. Now, air molecules were about the same as water molecules, mm, ish. But you can immediately eyeball this and say the density of the water molecules per unit volume is much higher than the air molecules per unit volume. And it's a factor of about a thousand. So imagine we have that one atmosphere of air and we put it into a diving bell and we just touch that diving bell on the surface of the water. But now we're going to take that diving bell and we're going to go down 10 meters in the water. For reference, humans are about two meters tall. Now for every 10 meters of water you go down, you get about one extra atmosphere of pressure. So you have two atmospheres of pressure pushing on the outside of the bell, but only one atmosphere of gas in the bell. So what happens is the liquid goes up into the bell and compresses the gas there. Practical upshot is the bell fills up about 50% with air with a pressure of about two atmospheres. But what if you want your diving bell not to be half full of water? Well, it's easy. You just pump more air into the diving bell. So now you have a diving bell that is full of two atmosphere pressure air. And so like that, you can happily jump in and out of the diving bell. So now let's take our diving bell from the surface and go down 100 meters. So now you've got about 10 extra atmospheres pushing on the outside. So it's going to compress the air inside the bell to about 10 atmospheres, filling the bell nine tenths 
with water. But again, this is not a terrible problem. You can just pump more 10 atmosphere pressure air into the diving bell and it'll be fine. Well, not quite. At about this time, you start running into problems with breathing that air and staying alive. You know, the solubility of other gases in your body start to kill you. So you can partially fix this by swapping out some of that gas for things like helium. But it gets very expensive very quickly. And it doesn't buy you a lot more depth. The bottom line is about 100 meters-ish is where humans can dive to while breathing compressed gases. But it's not the pressure on your body that's the problem here. It's more the high pressure of gases just start dissolving in your blood and start killing you that way. So if you want to go deep, there is only one way to do it. You have a really strong hull that keeps all of the water out and you have one atmosphere air on the inside of that sub. So you have none of the issues of the high pressure air. Now whales have evolved to live in the water obviously, so they've evolved ways that the high pressure gas isn't toxic to them in the way it's toxic for us. But the physical chemistry is exactly the same for the whales as it is for the diving bell. So if a whale would take a nice big breath of air just before he dives, by the time he gets down to 10 meters, the volume in his lungs will have about halved. It'll have exactly the same amount of air left in it, it's just it'll be half the volume. By the time he gets down to 100 meters, it'll be a tenth of that. And of course, these processes are just reversed when you surface again. Now, the abyss had a nice little scene in it like this, where if you actually fill your lungs up with a liquid that can transport the oxygen into your body, then these pressure issues aren't a problem anymore. Anyway, you breathe liquid so you can't get compressed. The pressure doesn't get you. You mean you got liquid in your lungs? Oxygenated fluorocarbon emulsion. Bullshit. And you can basically dive super deep. Well, actually, not so much. It turns out breathing liquid is really hard work. Uh, can I borrow your rat? What, what are you doing? Hey, hey, hey. No, no, gonna, no, 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 no. You're going to kill him! He's taking the fluid into his lungs. Being fine. See his chest moving? Getting plenty of oxygen. <laughs> Damn rat's breathing. That's not actually special effects. That is actually the rat in the fluorinated hydrocarbon. But as you might expect, the breathing apparatus for people, which was actually pursued for a bit, but the practical problems with it were just legion. And it basically went nowhere. But in principle, if you could get such a breathing kit to work, pressure ain't that much of a killer for people. Just like it ain't that much of a killer for the whales. But what saves you mostly here is the incompressibility of water. And you, just like the whales, are made up mostly of water. Now, when I say water is incompressible, which is not entirely true when you look at the details. And those details turn out to be pretty important in determining how you die at depth. In reality, water is perfectly compressible stuff. The nearest metaphor that I can give you is, here is a nice little spring. It's, you know, I put small amounts of force on it, and it changes its length by a lot. Here is a block of zirconium, where I can also push my finger on the top of it. It's actually exactly as reversibly compressible as the spring. It's just, it's a much, much, much stiffer spring. And it turns out it's that springiness that is actually what's going to kill you in the event of a hull rupture. Water at 1,000 atmospheres, which is give or take the pressure at the deepest parts of the ocean, the water is compressed by about 4%, which might not sound like much. And indeed, you know, if I were to show you a, a cube that has 4% less volume, you would barely be able to tell the two apart. In fact, whatever, let's do that. So here we have two cubes, one of which has 4% less volume than the other. Can you tell which one's which? Well, just to prove one is actually genuinely smaller than the other, I'm going to move one inside the other. So the one on the right there would be seawater at the surface. And if you were to take that exact volume of seawater and take it down to the deepest part of the ocean, it would look like the one on the left. And if you think it doesn't look like much, turns out this is what's going to kill you. But even if you're not going to dive down to kilometers deep into the ocean, it turns out that compression is still actually really important for 
A lot of people on the planet in that if the water wasn't compressible like that, sea level would be tens of meters higher all around the world. So water at this depth is a very, very, very strong spring. It's just there's nowhere for it to unspring to. Unless, of course, someone takes a nice little pocket of one atmosphere air all the way down into the ocean. So what sort of expansion are we looking at here? Well, let's go back to our molecular dynamics simulation. This is a simulation of water with periodic boundary conditions. That is, if a, a water goes out one side of the box, it comes back in the other. Now, I'm not going to compress this by a mere 4%, which would be the, you know, thousand atmospheres, the pressure at the deepest part of our oceans, because you would barely be able to see it with the eye. So I squeezed my box by 15%, which is utterly ludicrous pressures. This would be the pressure that you would get in the ocean if you could go down 30 kilometers. And a lot of people will say, there aren't any oceans that deep. Yeah, well, fine, whatever. If I would dig a hole that was 30 kilometers deep and fill it with water, this is what the water at the bottom of that hole would look like. It's roughly 10% yeah, denser than the water on the surface. So what happens if I take the pressure off? And to make this sporting, I'm going to do this in one atmosphere of air, which is what people in a deep sea submersible would be breathing. So there you have it. That's a cube of water that has been instantly transported from 3,000 atmospheres of pressure to one. Let's see what happens. And to the untrained eye, not a lot, really. Uh, did you see anything spectacular? Was there any explosive decompression? I mean, all that really seems to be happening is the water's forming a ball because of surface tension. And then you've got to realize we're on kind of a different time scale here. You see the gas molecules there. Remember what I was saying earlier? They're traveling at about the speed of sound. Now let's take a look at what happens to the immediate relaxation of the droplet when the pressure is released. So to make things a little clearer here, we're just going to look at the corner of the box. And I've drawn where the periodic boundary conditions used to be. And we're going to look at what happens in the instant when you take that pressure off. The water expands basically by about 5% on each axis, or the volume has changed by about 15%. The volume of the water droplet is now the volume of a water droplet under essentially one atmosphere of pressure. The water has essentially decompressed in that incredibly short period of time. Not only that, we know that atmospheric pressure is basically caused by those gas molecules, that's the red and the blue ones, impacting with things. That's what atmospheric pressure is. So we can see that the rate of expansion of the water is much, much faster than any impacts of the gas molecules with the surface. That is that atmospheric pressure is essentially irrelevant here. In fact, we can see from this that it really wouldn't make that much difference if the water expansion was done in a vacuum. In fact, as far as the water droplet is concerned, what it's expanding into is mostly vacuum. We also have a nice internal barometer from the speed of the gas molecules there, because we know that on average those travel at about the speed of sound. So at this we can see that the expansion is at least comparable with the speed of sound. But we can get other estimates of it as well. So give or take the length of the OH bond in water is about a tenth of a nanometer. And the time scale for this expansion is about one ten thousandth of a nanosecond. So a tenth of a nanometer in a ten thousandth of a nanosecond is one nanometer in a thousandth of a nanosecond. Or one meter in a thousandth of a second, which is a thousand meters per second. Give or take three times the speed of sound. Three times the speed of a bullet. So in reality, it turns out the rate that the water decompresses at is roughly the speed of sound in a liquid, which is roughly 10 times what it is in gas. Or maybe five times if you actually want to check the numbers. But a factor of two really is not going to make a lot of difference here. So when you get these very violent decompression events, where it's essentially being driven by the springiness of the water, you have to despringify enough of the water to actually fill the sub. 
So if the water is super compressed by 10% or so, volume of the sub is a, a cubic meter or so, you only need to decompress about 10 cubic meters of water to completely fill the sub. So if you can open the door on the sub in an instant, the water will be at zero atmospheres immediately and it'll start to expand. And that expansion wave only has to go about 10 times the volume of the sub before it's completely filled the sub. The expansion wave will travel about 10 times the speed of sound, so in this case, water would enter the sub at about 10 times the speed of sound, which is pretty much the physical limit for which you can have water entering the sub due to being compressed. If the sub, however, is only at, a, say, a kilometre depth where the compression is, eh, let's just call it 1%, it'll actually be less than that, but let's just say that for the sake of argument. Now you have to decompress a volume of water 100 times the volume of the sub. Now the decompression wave, of course, will travel at almost exactly the same speed that it did at stupid depths. It's just that it now has to travel further to decompress more water. The practical upshot is that decompression wave will have to go through a lot more water before it'll actually fill the sub, which is why it'll take longer. But some little back of the envelope calculations say the water will still be coming in at about two times the speed of sound. So the crazy thing here is it's not actually high pressure water that kills you at depth. It's regular pressure water. It's just moving very fast. And of course, once the sub's full of water, there will be an almighty bang as the best part of a ton of water moving well beyond the speed of sound comes to a halt almost instantly. And there'll be lots of other audio artifacts due to the re-equilibration of that area of low pressure water as well. And what with water being an excellent transmitter of sound, bottom line, you'll hear this from a long way away. So your real enemy here is the compressibility of water, not the pressure, in that if the water were truly incompressible, the sub would just fill up water at roughly free fall speed, irrespective of the depth, rather than what it does, which is fill with water at roughly the speed of sound. Anyway, I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. Hope you found the video informative, and as ever, thanks for watching.